Welcome to Middle East Dialogues, a series of conversations with leading scholars and writers, produced by the University of Denver's Center for Middle East Studies. Your host for this episode is Andrea Stanton, an affiliate faculty member of the Center and an associate professor at the University of Denver's Department of Religious Studies. Our guest for this episode is Kareem Makdisi. Makdisi is an associate professor of international politics at American University of Beirut. He serves as the faculty research director for the UN in the Arab world at AUB's Institute for Public Policy and International Affairs, where he also formally served as associate director. His publications include Land of Blue Helmets, the UN in the Arab World, and Interventions in Conflict, International Peacemaking in the Middle East, co-edited with Rami Khoury and Martin Wallish. Thank you so much for joining us today and for coming to Denver to spend time at DU. Um, I'd like to just say on behalf of my colleagues, um, Nader Hashmi, who's the director of our Center for Middle East Studies, and Danny Postel, who's our former associate director, um, just how delighted we are to have you here. Um, we know that you've already met with several faculty and also some DU students, and we're looking forward to having you speak here tomorrow on the UN in Syria. So um, could I just start on that note by asking you to tell us a little bit about how you became interested in the UN? Yes, uh, well thank you, first of all, thank you very much for hosting me here. It's been great and I'm very happy to be here. Um, my interest in the UN actually is long-standing. I mean, uh, you, when, you, when you live and grow up in Lebanon, of course the UN is all around you and that's the kind of premise mm -hmm. of some of the, my interest in the UN as a, as a young guy. Uh, but then through graduate school, uh, through my master's and PhD, uh, I studied a lot of international relations, international law, and uh, the history and politics of the United Nations. And when I moved back to Beirut, uh, in 2001, after my PhD, I worked in the Regional Commission, ESQA, the Economic and Social Commission for West Asia. Um, and it happened to be during the time of the Intifada, the Second Intifada, and at the same time, the Iraq War. And uh, so it, it, it just was an extraordinary time to be inside the UN, but to be somebody, of course, who's also quite critical of, of what the UN has done over the years, uh, and to interact with people, and to realize, of course, that the UN is, is many different things. There's the Security Council, kind of the big decisions taking place, uh, and then there's the staff and, and the kind of people who, who generally mean well and, and try to do whatever good work they can try to do in, in the locations that, that they are. Um, and it was particularly strange being inside the regional commission where something like 80% of the staff are Arab in one form or the other, uh, mostly at the time sort of Arab with Arab nationalist background. And uh, trying to sort out how, how do you represent yourself as the UN, um, but at the same time uh, express a kind of concern, uh, worry, and general angst over the fact that there's this uh, invasions and attacks on Iraq, that there is the continued Israeli occupation in, the, in, the, uh, in, the, in Palestine, and, and, and various kind of instability that the UN was at the time beginning to be seen more as almost collaborating with the United States in the kind of post 9-11 period. So it, it was a very interesting time um, and I obviously from the inside was beginning to, to, to see how this would work uh, from that perspective. Uh, when I moved to AUB, to the American University of Beirut, um, I started teaching there um, and I was there during this kind of period where it culminated in the Israeli invasion in 2006. And uh, so I got quite involved in, in, in uh, both in media, sort of a lot of journalists and people come and going talking about this thing, and tapping into my, my knowledge of the way the UN works, and then tracking the way the UN resolutions were evolving in, during that war, and the kind of from the draft resolutions to the final resolution, uh, which was resolution 1701, which I've worked a lot on, and, um, and the kind of interaction between the way the Security Council uh, was trying to come up with a certain conclusion which simply didn't reflect the way in which the battles were taking place on the ground. So how do you separate? How do, how do, how do the Security Council thinking with the great powers in America and France, and I don't know if France is a great power anymore, but these kinds of countries uh, trying to impose certain settlements, certain understandings of, of war and peace, and at the same time you have resistances on the ground that simply no longer accepted those kinds of uh, resolutions, and so how does that, how does that get reflected? Yes, well, I think you bring up an important point, and for anyone who's been to Beirut or spent time in Syria or spent time in Palestine, the UN is both 
an international organization mm -hmm. and a set of DC local organizations. Um, <clears throat> and I should have said at the outset that your latest work reflects this interest um, and is The Land of Blue Helmets, The United Nation and the Arab World, um, which just came out last fall. Mm -hmm. um, it's an edited collection with um, Vijay Prashad, who I think was also at AUB yes. for some time. Yes. Um, and it was published by the University of California Press. Yes. Um, and so could I turn and then ask you a bit about the kind of editorial construction of this book? Um, as you know, the contributors are a mix of practitioners and scholars, um, including some very high level UN officials, some very familiar names if you yeah. work on the region. Um, and we here have been really impressed at your ability to get such original and very thoughtful chapters from career UN people, especially mm -hmm. for an academic book. Yeah. Um, and some of these essays also offer some very self-critical reflections on the failure of the UN mm. and its various agencies. So I wonder if you can just share with us kind of your editorial process of getting people to contribute such substantive chapters mm. um, and also what you think um, these kind of reflections and critiques might tell us. Yeah, well, it, it's, a, it's actually a, a quite a long process uh, that <laughs> began uh, after the 2006 war. And I, I began a uh, research project at the Aysan Ferris Institute mm -hmm. for Public mm -hmm. Policy and International Affairs at AUB, where I was also at the time an associate director. And I began uh, a UN, I called it the UN and the Arab World Research and Policy Program. And it started first by, by trying to understand the way in which, you know, we had a lot of UN people coming into Lebanon. Obviously, mm -hmm. it's a regional mm -hmm. hub. Uh, there's all sorts of people coming and going. So we tried, you know, to bring UN officials in to try to explain from their perspective what was going on. We would also host um, scholars and um, people, you know, just civil society types that would come in and try to unpack a little bit uh, things from their often critical perspective, but also NGOs that were more just trying to survive and trying to kind of figure out how to, how to deal with the humanitarian and development issues and refugee issues. Uh, so, you know, it, it sort of grew out of this, and my, my, my own interest uh, kept on expanding. And we, we ended up inviting so many people, and really there was such an interest in this. And it, and it was rather unique, I think, uh, to, to have such a kind of program in a, in a country, in an area where the UN is so familiar, but at the same time there's so much cynicism about the UN, where, you know, the UN is either seen as, as a, purely as an instrument of, of great power politics, and so therefore largely dismissed as an object of study or as an object of mm -hmm. a kind of relevance even uh, in, in the region. Uh, so it, it kind of developed out of this, and so a lot of the people, especially the practitioners, but also the scholars, but the practitioners in particular, uh, I had met and invited and interacted with when they would visit Beirut, and, and, or if I was in New York, but largely when they would come to Beirut, and we would have them come and give talks, and we would you know, con continue the conversations. Uh, so, so somebody like uh, somebody like um, uh, Filippo Grandi, who who at the time was the head of uh, head of UNRWA, the the UN agency that deals with Palestine refugees, uh, who is now the head of UNHCR, of course, mm -hmm. uh, you know the head of the <coughs> general UN agency that deals with all all refugees in the world. And it's interesting because UNRWA is the only uh, refugee agency that's outside of the larger UNHCR system. Uh, so he, you know, I, I, I had a, you know, he, he's a wonderful guy, and we had a lot of conversations. He came two or three times, gave talks at AUB. Uh, we interacted with him quite a bit, and then uh, when he finished his his, uh, his job at UNRWA, uh, he took a sabbatical and wanted to write his own mm -hmm. memoirs, you know, mm -hmm. begin to write. And uh, I invited him to spend basically a year at AUB, uh, at the institute, uh, where we provided him an office. We tried to, you know, help as much as possible, and he, and he was great company and you know mm -hmm. helped with students and you know he, people could just drop in and talk to him and so out of this developed this idea saying okay look we're, we're working on on this project and i very much wanted him to contribute knowing full well that a lot of u.n officials you know will tend to produce very anemic or, or n not so interesting very diplomatic mm -hmm. not interesting kinds of pieces uh, but I knew that Filippo in particular was somebody that would write something quite interesting based on the talks he gave at AUB, which were quite honest, surprisingly honest, mm -hmm. and quite vivid. And he has quite a, you know, a, 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 an interesting and vivid way of talking and writing. Uh, so he wrote re really, an, uh, w I think, one of the best pieces in, in, in this book uh, on his reflections um, on, on his experience as Commissioner General uh, and, and the kind of plight of the Palestinians, but seen also within the larger international arena and the kind of donor politics. So how do you, as the head of UNRWA, deal both with uh, the politics of donors who want a particular agenda and, uh, and the fact that uniquely among UN agencies, uh, 
uh, you have uh, uh, the vast bulk of the staff mm -hmm. are actually Palestinians mm -hmm. and Palestinian refugees. And so there, you know, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of strange things that go on. So on the one hand, it provides incredible services, in, especially mm -hmm. in health and education, um, and is, is almost like a government for, for, for the Palestinians in many ways uh, in, in a lot of the refugee areas, especially a place like Lebanon, uh, where the Lebanese government basically doesn't deal with them in any meaningful way. And not only doesn't deal with them, but actually discriminates against them. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really do much. Um, and on the other hand, this notion that a lot of the Palestinians feel that, you know, why is it that international staff will get huge salaries, will you know, mm -hmm. uh, have huge benefits, will do all these things, and will uh, will be at the upper levels of administration, make the big decisions, and then the Palestinians are sort of the ones with lower salaries, working on the ground, the ones risking themselves, doing most of the work, and yet, you know, their mm -hmm. their, their input wasn't taken seriously. So th there's, you know, there's all sorts of politics that go into this thing, with the under, you know, with with of course the basic idea that you have this Palestine refugee problem, which went from something which was meant to be a temporary thing solved in the 1950s, mm -hmm. maybe the 1960s, um, and of course now, it's this kind of it became this open-ended uh, problem or or question, and without much resolution in sight. So. The vast bulk of refugees, of course, want the kind of right of return. They want to go back to their homes in one form or the other. At least the, the idea mm -hmm. of it is overwhelmingly still there. Uh, and yet, of course, the donors, uh, the Americans, mm -hmm. the Europeans, etc., are all uh, totally against that idea, basically. Mm -hmm. and, and so there's this incredible politics taking place. And Philippe kind of goes through this, uh, through his experience. And uh, at the time, there was the Battle of Syria war had begun, and he had come from the Yarmouk uh, uh, sites mm -hmm. in you know where a lot of the Palestinians in Syria were, were based and uh, and there was a siege at the time and just so he went through that and it's a kind of a harrowing experience and so you have 48 you have uh, the Lebanon war you have you know all these different periods where the Palestinian refugees you know get tossed around get attacked and end up in this incredible humanitarian but also political disaster mm -hmm. so you know there, he, there's Richard Falk who was a special rapporteur of mm -hmm. course mm -hmm. and uh, very well-known international <coughs> legal scholar, and, and uh, so he contributed also a very interesting piece uh, from his experience as a special rapporteur. And again, one of the big themes of the book was uh, trying to show the difference between what goes on in the Secretariat, in New York, in the Security Council, <coughs> the kind of politics that's dominated by the United States and, and these kinds of countries, versus those that are trying to work um, you know, in the different agencies, on the ground, in the Human Rights Council, uh, in, in these different places who are completely different. And another person that kind of picks up that theme is Hans von Sponek, who was, mm. uh, who wrote, who, who was, who wrote really an, an excellent piece as well, uh, reflecting on his experience um, dealing with Iraq in the 1990s. And he was sent there. Uh, you know, of course, Iraq was, was this incredible case where they were supposed to go in and check for weapons of mass destruction, which, of course, never, never appeared. And yet, uh, mm -hmm. as the humanitarian disaster uh, through the sanctions imposed by the United States and by other countries uh, was progressing, people like Hans von Sponek went in to try to come up with this humanitarian exception, to try mm -hmm. to the oil for food program, mm -hmm. and to try to balance out the kind of uh, Western imposition of sanctions, which was hurting civilians for the most part, much less so Saddam Hussein and the government, on the one hand, and the kind of people suffering on the other. And he, he goes through and, and show in a very interesting way and shows, again, the difference between the politics of the Security Council, uh, the Secretary, the Secretary General, those guys that are captured in New York within a certain framework, and those that were working very hard to try to push through these kinds of humanitarian issues and try to help civilians in, as much mm -hmm. as possible. Again, so, uh, uh, and all these people kind of, most of them came through Beirut and we, ha you know, we got to know them very well. And so, uh, we were quite confident that they would write interesting mm -hmm. essays. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, we went through and, and, and made sure that there was a back and forth so that we knew what they were going to write and they understood what we wanted as much as possible from them. So, so there, was a, there was a bunch of, we had uh, others like Shad and Khalaf, uh, who, who were who still are current UN employees um, working uh, around the refugees in, in Syria. Um, but based in Jordan. So, the, you know, we had a bunch of, of people uh, that really contributed. And, and again, I mean, not to go on too long, but the idea is uh, to mix in kind of established scholars, people like Laurie Allen and others uh, who've written a lot about the UN, uh, mostly from the critical side, um, 
with these practitioners to give a good balance about how, how kind of life in the UN and the different parts of the UN kind of compete with each other, conflict with each other, mm -hmm. um, but also shape the way in which we, we see international politics, local politics, regional politics in the Arab world. It's really a prodigious effort and it's a very mm -hmm. important work and important contribution and <clears throat> simply breaking apart the idea of the UN as one kind of internally homogenous yeah. blob I mm -hmm. think is itself a, a major contribution. If I could just pick up on one of the, the strands of what you were saying, um, I think what you also point to in referencing the Palestinians is how much the United Nations as an organization or set of organizations grew up from the beginning mm -hmm. deeply involved and implicated yeah. in the Arab world, right? Yeah. Whether we're talking about partition plans yeah. or the creation of UNRWA. Yeah. Um, and it, it seems that this is really kind of a, a central argument of your mm. book or a central point that you would like readers to recognize yeah. how deeply the history of the UN is intertwined with mm. multiple crises in the Arab world mm. um, and that how that continues all the way to the present. So um, could I ask you to talk a little bit more about this and how you see the kind of key um, intertwinings and influences and impacts between the Arab world and the UN? Yeah, well, it's, it's one of the, the two or three main themes. So, so how, on the one hand, how the UN itself is part and parcel of the politics and history of the region. Uh, Palestine partition is, you know, it starts with mm -hmm. the very creation of the UN, but also how, on the other hand, how the UN itself, and this is something which is kind of less known, uh, how the UN itself is shaped Mm -hmm. through its interaction in the, in the Middle East and the Arab world. Uh, so that, for instance, I mean, something that, that I think a lot of people not quite, d don't quite know, which is that the very idea of the political uh, special rapporteur types mm -hmm. come out of the Arab-Israeli, kind of come out of the Palestine conflict uh, very early on. The first observer mission is sent out into the Pal you know, Palestine around, around uh, you know, 48, 49, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, to, to kind of make sure that the, 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 the lines, the armistice lines are, are observed and protected. Uh, the very first peacekeeping mission, the kind of traditional peacekeeping mm -hmm. mission, um, was around the, uh, after the 1956 Suez War uh, between the Israelis and the Egyptians. And, uh, uh, and that, that remains to this day. And, and this is something which is, which the very, the, the kind of prototypes of both the observer missions and the traditional peacekeeping comes out of the interaction. Mm -hmm. uh, peacekeeping is not in the UN Charter. There's still to this day mm -hmm. no reference to peacekeeping in the UN Charter. So it gets created out of, you know, this idea of, of what was the UN supposed to be in the mm -hmm. Charter, this kind of great politics and power politics in the post-World War II period. And then it gets tested out in the field and in the labs. And the Middle East was one of the big labs in mm -hmm. which the UN was shaped, uh, especially during this period. And in fact, throughout the, the Cold War period, more than 50 percent of all the UN missions, peacekeeping mm -hmm. missions, uh, played out around the Arab-Israeli conflict, so it's it's a, it's a very interesting and um, w in terms of Palestine itself, and there's of course a number of essays that deal with Palestine and the Arab-Israeli conflict in general in the book. I mean, some might say disproportionate, but it's not because it reflects uh, the overwhelming mm -hmm. uh, uh, kind of Palestine case within the United Nations uh, from day one until today, when they're still trying to mm -hmm. they're still trying to get their state recognized in the Security Council and that kind of the quartet and the disaster of the quartet and the, the, the Middle East peace process kind of stuff. And uh, so from early on, uh, when the United Nations gets created out of World War II, um, the, the, there's a struggle between this, this it's, it's coming out of a kind of imperial project mm -hmm. on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, the kind of beginnings of this anti-colonial uh, struggle that really takes root more in the 60s mm -hmm. and 70s, unfortunately for Palestine, but in the 60s mm -hmm. and 70s, this becomes huge. But it, it begins with, the, with, with Nero and India, and then it progresses out of that. Uh, what, what, what we like to show in some of the other ones is this, this progression, both in terms of the development, the economics, and in terms of the politics and the, and the kind of refugee situation where the anti-colonial struggles um, in the 60s and 70s especially try to try to create a situation where, uh, where the Palestine question gets resolved in a particular kind of way, mm -hmm. where the right of return is presented in a certain kind of way, where, um, where vari various political problems get resolved in certain ways, with the bulk of the third world and the global south kind of mm -hmm. behind it, including developmental uh, uh, projects before neoliberalism and this idea of, of, uh, of uh, um, you know, national development projects. Um, and then in the post-Cold War period, how all this kind of falls apart with neoliberalism on the one hand, mm 
And on the other hand, this kind of unipolar moment where the United States uh, comes out, and of course, famously, George Bush uh, mm -hmm. uh, Sr. Mm -hmm. uh, proclaims his, you know, the new world order out of the Iraq War of 1990, where, of course, Iraq invades Kuwait, and uh, the, United, uh, the, United S the United Nations Security mm -hmm. Council uh, quite rightly, you know, gets together, and in the, in the proper kind of procedural way, they have a, a resolution that insists mm -hmm. that, that Iraq has to withdraw from Kuwait, a sovereign country, and that's, that's all correct. And so the New World Order, based on multilateralism, based on a renewed mm -hmm. hope of Security Council intervention, which was blocked during the Cold War in the kind of mm -hmm. Soviet Union, American kind of stalemate in the Security Council, um, this was supposed to be the moment. But that quickly descends, that quickly is lost, uh, as on the one hand, the kind of sanctions and this incredible uh, uh, humanitarian suffering of, of, uh, of uh, uh, people, in, civilians in Iraq in the 1990s, on the one hand, and the total failure of the kind of removal of the United Nations on the question of Palestine. Mm -hmm. So with the Oslo peace mm -hmm. process, with the kind of effectively the subcontracting of peace process to America uh, with the kind of Norwegian, I would not say objective, I would say quite subjective, quite, mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, there's the myth of, of kind of Norwegian neutrality. I don't think that's true for the most part. Uh, there are a lot of good people, obviously, but structurally Oslo was set up in order to uh, create a situation, a sustained occupation mm -hmm. of, uh, and as you see today, you know, increasingly difficult situation for the Palestinians, humanitarian-wise, but also political-wise. I mean, the idea that uh, that that you know we're we're as far away from a two-state solution as you could possibly get starts in this 1990s with the UN kind of accepting to be to, to abdicate itself from this process. So mm -hmm. Iraq, Palestine, um, uh, both end up in this kind of disastrous uh, uh, directions. And then the third part of this, which is interesting in the post-Cold War period, is that as the U.S. and as the U.N. itself kind of proclaim the kind of, you know, the democracy and the, the you know, the global liberal mm -hmm. project kind of takes root in this period in, in Africa and Latin America, and, you know, in East Europe and these places, the Middle East kind of is, is left alone. You have mm -hmm. still the old interventionist policies that keep in place people like Hosni Mubarak in, in Egypt, in, in Tunisia, in Yemen, all you know, in, in Libya, all these kinds of old authoritarians, uh, there was very little international Western support for kind of social movements that were trying mm -hmm. to uh, create better democratic uh, societies in, in in the Middle East, in the Arab world, which includes, of course, Palestine with intifadas, mm -hmm. with with the notion that that the Palestinians wanted to live at that time, even side by side with Israel, etc. But in a in a in a proper way, not in apartheid conditions, not in Bantustan kind of conditions. Uh, not inferior, but sort of equal. Um, that whole situation is it's kind of the Arab world is left to its own devices. It gets, mm -hmm. it gets resuscitated in the kind of Arab uprisings that happen later, uh, where, where the UN and the US and others say, ah, okay, now finally, you know, democracy mm -hmm. comes to the Arab world with, with, uh, with the removal of Ben Ali and the removal in Tunisia and the removal of Hosni Mubarak in Egypt. But that, that's very quick, you know, the, the, the liberal sort of project it goes very quickly, and um, and it's not because the Arabs are incapable of of having democracy, etc., which comes out, but much more so because the kinds of processes, the international politics, and even the way the UN had set itself up, mm -hmm. uh, at least the Security Council, uh, kind of precluded the idea that you could have proper social movements with proper democratic aspirations, because that went contrary mm -hmm. to the politics of the kind of old colonial powers, mm -hmm. and of course the elite that were entrenched in these regions, the economic, financial, and political elite. Uh, so th this was, I mean, it was a, a very interesting period um, in which you can, which this book, and my interest in general is to kind of trace this, this history. Mm -hmm. uh, I should of course add that, that you know, Vijay Prashad, who, who's, my, who's the co-editor of this book, of course is a well-known uh, historian of the Global South. Mm -hmm. And we met, uh, we, we had met before that, but he kind of came and spent a year at AUB um, as the Edward Said Chair in American Studies. And he spent a year, and it was an incredibly productive year. Uh, he's an incredibly energetic and, and mm -hmm. positive guy, mm -hmm. you know, very productive and writes mm -hmm. a lot. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he, his, his, his coming there kind of, you know, gave us a great opportunity to con collaborate and, and uh, merge this, this kind of study of the Middle East and the UN and the Middle East with, of course, this larger his, his interest, but also my interest in the kind of global south, kind of connecting mm -hmm. it uh, together. That's great, and I think 
you bring up several important points. Um, one of which for me is the way in which we know the history of states that want to be states trying to get UN attention and UN recognition, mm. right? As soon as the UN is created, getting yeah. validation by the UN becomes the key way that you become a state. I think of Algeria in particular. Um, and that's never worked for Palestine. Mm -hmm. um, so we know that side of it, yeah. but, um, <clears throat> but I think what you're also really drawing attention to is the way that the, the UN has also been shaped particularly yeah. by the region. Yeah. Um, and I would also say that what you were just saying more recently about yeah. the UN's maybe lack of attention to developments, social movements in general, but mm. particularly in the Arab world, is also its, its, its um, valoring, uh, valorizing of sovereignty. Yes. Um, and, yeah. and that also, for me, takes us into a more contemporary question, which is also yeah. in some ways sidelined the, the Palestine question, which is Syria. Yeah. Um, and you'll be speaking here tomorrow mm. um, about Syria and the UN. Mm. And so um, <clears throat> this, like all current events questions, is probably going to be somewhat um, short term in its mm. currency. But um, if you could just um, kind of share with us what you see is the most mm. likely United Nations scenario for um, involvement in the Syria issue in the short and medium term, and then also maybe what factors you think we might um, we might be missing that we should be paying attention to? Yeah. Uh, just be before that, I, I, you know, of course, I want to plug the, this, uh, mm -hmm. this study because we did with my, with a colleague, uh, Coralie Pison Hindewi, uh, we did, I, I think, a major study on the chemical weapons uh, joint mission of the UN and the OPCW, which is the organization that implements the Chemical Weapons Convention. So we, we had, you know, following our interests, of course, in the UN in general and the policies, of course, and intervention in the region. In particular, we, we, we spent about a year, year, year and a half uh, working, interviewing everybody that was involved in the initial mission that was, was there to eliminate uh, the, the Syrian chemical mm -hmm. weapons stockpile. And this and would that have been the mission after 2013? After 2013, that when that mm -hmm. first kind of dramatic mm -hmm. uh, chemical weapons attack in, in, in Damascus happened. Mm -hmm. And there was, you know, Obama's red line, and mm -hmm. uh, and there was a question of, you know, would America intervene militarily because supposedly mm -hmm. the red line was crossed. But right. there was this incredible right. uh, diplomacy that happened between the Russians and Americans, and ultimately, and a lot of domestic political issues within yes, the United States. Yes, absolutely. As well. mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, all sorts of issues mm -hmm. that ended in Syria acceding to the Chemical Weapons mm -hmm. Convention, and at the same time, a Security Council passing a resolution that kind of set up the framework for the elimination of the Syria chemical weapons. So we, we interviewed everybody to do with this joint mission and, and um, over the course of a year, so we went to The Hague, to New York, to countries which I won't name here, but mm -hmm. you know, all sorts <laughs> of countries uh, to, 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 to try to write that story from everybody that was involved in the mission itself mm -hmm. and to, to not only tell that story in, in quite minute detail, I might add, but also to try to draw uh, sort of larger conclusions about not only Syria, not only the chemical weapons, but disarmament in general, mm -hmm. uh, the role mm -hmm. of the UN in general, but also, of course, the geopolitics you know, of, of the region. Uh, and it, it, it's interesting because, of course, this chemical weapons story and the disarmament story was a huge success. Now, it's being rewritten in light of the new, mm -hmm. the, the, this <coughs> incredible chemical weapons attack that happened recently. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it, that 2013-14 story is being rewritten as a failure, but actually it was a great success in mm -hmm. defined at least narrowly within the mandate that the Security Council mm -hmm. provided it. It was, a, it was a big success. I mean, the vast, the, not the vast majority, 100% of the declared, and that's the key word, the declared chemical weapons stockpile was destroyed, was removed from the country and destroyed in an incredible, elaborate, um, complex kind of uh, thing that ended in in some of the, the worst chemical weapons being destroyed on an American private ship, mm. you know, in mm -hmm. sitting in the Mediterranean Sea, and some of the other stuff ending up in Texas and Finland and Germany and the UK mm. uh, for, for elimination. And th there was a lot of innovation, and, and this case, again, shows the way in which the UN, uh, and in this case the OPCW as well, both cases, both organizations, uh, developed and actually were beginning to be shaped once again through this experience in Syria. So this is the mm -hmm. first time that the chemical weapons uh, disarmament happens in the middle of a civil war. It's certainly the mm -hmm. first time. And uh, so the kinds of issues and the kind of coming together of this OPCW and the UN as a joint mission, as a joint venture, uh, which had never happened before as a kind of real partnership, backed by the Security Council, had never happened before. And this was, after this was used as a template, for instance, there was the case, the Ebola, mm 
virus case that happened uh, mm -hmm. and the kind of UN m a bunch of agencies and other things kind of worked together, they used the same people that came up with this mission, also kind of worked, largely worked on the Ebola mission and sort of became something that the UN itself uh, wanted to use partly as a template or kind of experiment it as a template because a lot of the other missions that were happening were not working out. Mm. So again, it's, it's part of the innovation that happens in the Middle East where these guys can come in, they experiment, they, it's like a lab, and then they go back and they say, okay, well, this is maybe a better way that we can try to get these resolved. So to go back to your question, mm -hmm. the idea is uh, this incredible success defined narrowly in terms of the mandate is of course contrasted with the utter failure of the Security Council uh, to try to resolve issues, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the political settlement and this battle between the Russians and the Americans were, you know, vetoing uh, different Security Council resolutions, taking different sides and, and this of course continues to this day. So the backdrop of failure of the, po of the, of the political settlements, the failure of Geneva 1, 2, 3, 4 now uh, in, in trying to come up with a settlement, the failure on the humanitarian side, uh, there was a huge failure in this. I mean, it was very difficult, obviously, hugely difficult to reach a lot of affected areas, uh, and that's true to this day. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of controversy about, you know, should the UN work with the Syrian government in order to distribute aid? On the other hand, that's how the UN works in all mm -hmm. countries in the world. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of tension, a lot of issues that took place. So why was this successful and the other ones, why did they fail? Um, and can, can there be something in there to try to kind of draw some tiny inspiration to say, well, how can, how can this work for trying to resolve uh, the conflict going forward? Now, you're asking this question, of course, I would say it's a, you know, we're, we're all deeply pessimistic uh, that anything is going to happen anytime soon. Uh, but it seems to me fairly obvious that, that unless you get the Russians and the Americans together in the way that they came together for this chemical weapons disarmament, mm -hmm. even though they were fighting on all other issues, including the Ukraine, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, there was, uh, um, you know, as soon as they came together, this issue was resolved incredibly quickly, incredibly effectively. Um, is that going to happen anytime soon for the UN to act? I, I can't, I don't know, maybe, maybe tomorrow, maybe after tomorrow, but eventually it, it's going to happen. The mm -hmm. only question is the timing, and the only question is how many more people are going to have to die for there to be a political settlement. Um, so I, I didn't really answer your question, but I, it's, it is difficult to answer that. Well, I think you gave us quite a lot to think about and also a, a really important framing of the previous well-known chemical attacks, the 20, August 2013 attack, mm. and what happened in terms of UN involvement after that, and then the pessoptimist yeah. <laughs> approach um, yeah. to what might come next. Um, and I understand you're working on a follow-up um, mm. to this particular study, mm. um, but that also, if we could just close by talking about your other current work, which is a book on the 2006 war in mm. Lebanon, mm. Um, also a <clears throat> very important event yeah. that also in some ways engaged Syria and Palestine and Israel and very mm. much engaged the UN. So mm. um, could I close by asking you to yeah. tell us a little bit more about that, please? Yes. Um, it, it, this, this is, you know, I, I sort of started with this and, and I'm I don't know if I'm ending with it, but it's, it's uh, maybe bookmarking my, my whole interest in, in this. Uh, this has also been in the works for over a decade now. Mm -hmm. Frankly, it might have been a book I, I might have written you know, many years ago. Uh, but it's, it's pulling together, we just passed the 10th anniversary of this war, and it's pulling together my interest both in the UN and the UN politics uh, as, a, as a site of conflict, as a site of conflict, and the way the kind of geopolitics get, get played out through the Security Council resolutions, but also then how it travels into the region, into mm -hmm. the kind of country like Lebanon. And at the same time, the kind of larger um, history of interventions in the region um, that go back, of course, very long, but uh, you know, the proximate cause as well in the post-2003 American invasion of, of Iraq, which is seminal to, to everything mm -hmm. that we can think mm -hmm. about in this region till this day. Um, the, the idea that you can think about anything from Syria to Lebanon to Palestine to anything else in its recent frame without, uh, without grounding it in the 2003 war is, is very difficult to understand how people can do that. Uh, but the idea is that this 2003 war, um, it, it, it sort of reaches, it, it's the second step as that pro the kind of American neocon project was to try to take down Syria, Mm -hmm. Hezbollah, mm -hmm. and then of course reach Iran. Mm -hmm. uh, it sort of stops in Lebanon because the Israelis and the Americans, uh, kind of the Americans who quite 
strongly supported the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 2006, were unable ultimately to, to kind of reach the objective of destroying Hezbollah. Uh, and of course Hezbollah, at the end of 33 days, in effect, it's not so much wins the war, but the Israelis certainly lose that war mm -hmm. because they're unable to achieve their objectives. Now, this kind of plays out in the Security Council and the debates in the UN, but also it also plays out in the way in which the kind of, uh, let's say, tension between those who are working in the UN office mm -hmm. uh, in Beirut, who have to mediate between all these different mm -hmm. parties and try to reach a settlement when, there was an, you know, when the war was not, didn't reach the conclusion people in New York thought it would, and on the other hand, people working in New York that wanted, that were kind of swaying to the pressure of America and France yeah. at the time. And so how do you reconcile these things and produce a Security Council resolution mm -hmm. that everybody can agree to uh, at a time when the kind of humanitarian side of the war was growing exponentially? Mm -hmm. You had over a thousand casualties, uh, civilians mostly in Lebanon, of course, mm -hmm. where something like 90 percent of the people who died were, of course, Lebanese and were uh, largely civilians. You had the villages that had been completely destroyed. You had a part of Beirut that had been completely destroyed. A lot of the civilian infrastructure had been destroyed. And we now know uh, through Israeli sources, of course, that after the first few days of the, of the war, when the Israelis thought they could destroy Hezbollah, they had run out of targets. So they went increasingly to more civilian targets and uh, couldn't stop, in a sense, without the sense that they were going to be defeated. Uh, and this kind of continued until eventually a resolution was produced that and my argument is this, and it's also the argument in the Syrian chemical weapons case, where you end up with this uh, kind of UN resolutions that end up reflecting two sets of narratives that kind of coexist but also are in conflict with each other. Mm -hmm. So each of these sides can claim victory mm -hmm. uh, and a kind of coexist in a resolution, but, and that's good because it helps resolve the issue mm -hmm. temporarily. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it creates, you know, the seeds of kind of future conflict remain because each one can still claim that their side of the narrative is inside. It's true, by the way, in the Syria case as well, where the Russians and the Americans both kind of claimed victory mm -hmm. uh, for the kind of resolution that was produced uh, in the disarmament case, where the Americans said it was the fact that we threatened military force. That's what produced the disarmament. And it's the Russians and the Syrian government that said, no, it's because of diplomacy, it's because of voluntary, the voluntary uh, desire to kind of rid the country of chemical weapons. That's what won the day. And both of these are contained within the resolution. Mm. Same thing around the 2006 war. The final point of the 2006 war is that it's uh, not so much UN, but sort of the general history of intervention, is that because Hezbollah was not defeated, it became... Uh, it went from a kind of local Lebanese kind of group that's kind of strong resistance group to one, it became a regional player mm -hmm. and became hugely popular across the Arab world mm -hmm. and the Middle East and even the Islamic world and among left, leftists and kind of in, in anybody in the global south. Um, that became very threatening, especially in the Gulf and to Saudi Arabia and mm -hmm. to these kinds of forces. And it kind of set the seeds where increasingly the Saudis and, and, and others in the Gulf uh, began to see Iran, which had begun to grow in power, not through anything they did, frankly, but mm -hmm. because Iraq had destroyed the Iraqi state, which was, w which in a sense was the natural enemy of the mm -hmm. previous two or three decades. And so Iran was beginning to grow. As Iran was growing, uh, the, the Saudis and the GCC countries were getting increasingly frightened about Iranian power. Hezbollah was considered to be an extension of Iran. So the kind of Saudis began to increasing, increase uh, the kind of conflict with the Iranians played out in all these different countries. We see this today in Yemen, we see this in Lebanon, we see this certainly in Syria, which, which has become unfortunately a playground for this kind of regional conflict, much more than the kind of plight of Syrian civilians. Um, and so it's being played out, and the sectarian tone that it's taken is a reflection of the Saudi kind of Iranian war uh, that's taking place. And so, is, so Lebanon 2006 is really is the, you know, Iraq 2003, but then Lebanon 2006 really, mm -hmm. uh, it, it sort of begins this, this phase of, of the kind of Iran-Saudi kind of coming together within the larger global context where the Americans and the old colonials are, have set an old framework mm -hmm. where these countries have to be at conflict. And of course the Israelis, as they often do, are kind of their main interest is to kind of make sure they, that, that there's a lack of stability in the region and to try to get people uh, to try to kind of 
stoke the, the, the flames of sectarianism. And so you have an increasing Saudi-Israeli kind of coming together in terms of their interests mm -hmm. and strategies to try to fight an Iranian Syrian Hezbollah kind of uh, you know resistance mm -hmm. or uh, you know front that's against the American interests and against Western interests and uh, trying to impose their own set of interests in the region. So this is this incredible thing. Lebanon 2006 plays a very important role, I think, in this. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think for those of us who remember it, it was both a very small war and yeah. obviously had very large ramifications. Yeah. And I think the is ramifications on Israel, certainly on Israeli domestic policy and military yeah. strategy, have been probably the best known. But for yeah. Lebanese domestic politics, Syrian regional politics, yeah. and as you point out, the Gulf politics, yeah. I mean, this is, you're, you're drawing our attention to yeah. what was a deeply significant yeah. 33 days. Um, so thank you again so much. Okay. We're really, really thank pleased you. to have you on campus, and um, we greatly appreciate your insights. Thank you very much.